Okay, this is going to be the second lecture for the February 8th, 2014 uh, paramedic refresher for Trotwood Fire and Rescue. We're going to go over geriatric pharmacology. Alright, just some statistics for us. So, essentially it says age by uh, patients transported by ambulance. Um, we talked about this in the last lecture. So, in 1987, um, obviously you can see we were probably about uh, you know 53 you know 54 uh, versus you know under 65 and then we got that steady decrease so you can see that between you know 87 to 2030 I mean we're gonna be transporting quite a few people uh, you know from an age factor and the under 65 is actually seems to be trending down versus over 65 that's you know, tremendously going up so the chronological age is only one factor regarding the changes that affect the aging population. So others include the drug usage patterns, so nutritional states, polypharmacy, reduced finances, lifestyle, decreased compliance, multiple diseases, pharmacological changes. Um, these are all different things. You know, they, you know, obviously the drug usage patterns, that's good and bad. Um, nutritional states, you know, we talked about that. People are living longer because they actually are eating healthier. Polypharmacy, so they're taking a lot of medications. Once again, that could be good, that could be bad. Um, you know, we start mixing chemicals or we start mixing pharmacological agents together. We can have adverse effects. With reduced finances, so they don't make as much money. So the cost of healthcare is going up. However, you know, a lot of these people are retired. They can't work anymore. So they don't have as much money coming in. So they're not able to afford the medications. And then their lifestyle or a sedentary lifestyle. So it says the 1% rule. Most organ systems lose function at roughly about 1% a year, beginning at around the age of 30. So you know, essentially you're going to lose you know, 10% of your organ function by 40, 20% by 50, you know, and so on and so forth. So people with renal failure, they may develop anemia, hypertension, arthrosclerotic heart disease. People with diabetes may develop that renal failure, arthrosclerotic heart disease, blindness, um, hypercholesterolemia, and are subject to infection and gangrene. People with pulmonary disease, it says it puts a strain on the cardiovascular system and are at a higher risk for infection and hypoxia, which in turn leads to the organ ischemia. All right, people with the cardiovascular disease, it says that it can develop ischemia of the lungs, liver, intestine, and kidneys, which causes liver failure, dead bowel, and renal failure. They, must all, they will also develop strokes, phlebitis, TIAs, cardiac dysrhythmias, and syncope. All right, so absorption. Um, it says pharmacokinetic changes, so they're not able to absorb as much. Um, once again, their liver doesn't detoxify. Their kidneys can't get rid of the waste. So the age may alter the absorption rates, um, so they'll have that altered nutritional habits, greater use of non-prescription drugs. And then the changes in gastric emptying is a lot slower, so that motility just doesn't move as fast. They don't get rid of the gastric contents as easy. So the disruption, I'm sorry, distribution, so it's dependent on the chemical, chemical characteristics of the drug, the blood flow themselves, the size and composition of the body compartments. The elderly have a reduced lean body mass that reduced total and percentage uh, body water. Increased fat or as percentage of body mass, and it's usually a decrease in the serum albumin, which binds many drugs, in it, including the weak acids. The changes may alter the appropriate loading dose of the drug, which may not affect the maintenance dosing. All right, so reducing the loading dose of a digoxin and CHF patient due to decreased circulating volume. <clears throat> With metabolism, so certain drugs are metabolized a lot slower. Others are due, uh, they're due to decreased hepatic circulation. In other words, their liver is just not detoxifying as well because their hepatic circulation is decreased. They're not able to metabolize these medications as well. So because they're not able to metabolize them as well, when they do metabolize them, they don't get rid of them as quick. And then also because they're not, their liver is not able to absorb them as well, then they're not getting the full effect of the medication. So the decline in the ability of the liver to, uh, to recover from the injury or disease and that malnutrition and liver disease impairs the hepatic function. 
All right, so getting rid of the waste. So decreased renal function. This is evidenced by the age-related decline in the creatine clearance, prolongation of the half-life of many drugs. The elderly is losing recommendations, including allowance for reduced renal clearance. Nutritional changes, dehydration. This is, may have a marked reduction in the renal clearance. Lungs excrete certain drugs, so use inhalation drugs with caution. They're a lot more sensitive to sedative or hypnotics and analgesics. So that's why, you know, you give them a little bit of morphine or fentanyl, and that goes a long way. They have a decreased responses to beta energic stimulants and then beta blockers. So beta blockers don't work as well because their body basically doesn't absorb them as well. And that decreased homeostatic control. Once again, this is because they're not able to maintain their body temperature. Then a lot of times they will become hypothermic. They become acidotic, alkalotic, and they get very ill because their body is, you know, not able to keep that constant control. So phenothiazines and haloperidol. It's commonly used and are misused. Now the useful is schizophrenia, delirium, dementia, agitation, combativeness, certain paranoid syndromes. And they have no effect on Alzheimer's dementia. A lot of times they'll take lithium, so it's used to treat mania. And it's concurrent use with the thiazide diuretics um, reduces the lithium clearance. Okay, so different confusional states uh, in the elderly. So for delirium, it's abrupt. They usually have a reduct, uh, reduced attention and a very disorganized thinking. Versus dementia, it's very gradual. This is the one we talked about. It, can, it goes over from months to years. They have that impaired recent memory, and typically they'll have a regression. They kind of revert back to you know earlier times. So at least the two of the fall, and they have a reduced level of consciousness, the perceptual disturbance, an altered cycle of motor um, activity. Versus dementia, they have the disjointed thinking, poor judgment, or loss of mental function. All right, keep in mind with antidepressants, um, the suicide rate is twice the national average. Depression is underdiagnosed. And it is undertreated in the elderly. So a lot of times they just, people take it for granted that, you know, ah, it is what it is. You know, they're just getting older. You know, they only get out. It's very, very underdiagnosed. And they actually need, a lot of them need to be on antidepressants. So it's often mistaken for senile dementia. And antidepressants are very effective, but the elderly are more prone to the toxic effects. So that's why it's better to put them on a low dose because they are effective instead of a higher dose. So some of the drugs they use for Alzheimer's disease characterized by a progressive memory impairment and cognitive functions, and it can lead to a vegetative state, and it's believed to be worse by believed to be caused by a decreased brain levels of um, glutamate, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. All right, so all the happy stuff, all the stuff that makes you happy. So they're often sensitive to central nervous system drug toxicities. Um, and then treatments would be cholinometric drugs, so decreased uh, cholinergic neurons, uh, MOAI, or, um, so the inhibitors, the cerebral vasodilators, and the nerve growth factors. And some of the examples would be like Tactrin and, and then Donopessil. Donopessil. So antihypertensive drugs, thiazides, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitors. These are all things that we need to keep in mind that um, it's very easy to overdose on. That's why we've got you know, the calcium channel blocker and the beta blocker overdose protocol. And then in turn, ACE inhibitors, you know, that's where we start worrying about angioedema, that like swelling of the tongue. Um, they have a positive inotropic agent. So they have the cardiac glycosides or the joxin. Toxic effects are very dangerous. Clearance is decreased. The circulating volume is frequently diminished. Antirhythmic drugs. Um, so it's challenging due to the lack of the good hemodynamic reserve. They have frequent electrolyte imbalances. And they have a high incidence of severe coronary artery disease. And the halftime of lidocaine is increased because of this. So remember with uh, antimicrobial drugs. High incidence of infections, they have a reduction in the host defenses. 
So it's contributed to prolongation of life more than any other drug group and pharmacokinetic changes related to the decreased renal and or hepatic function. So any inflammatory drugs like those non-steroidal um, any inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen basically so we use them to treat osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis um, for aspirin things we need to be aware of is GI irritation and bleeding so if they've got um, you know angiomas anything like that in their intestines remember that because of that if they have bleeding they can get bleeding in their stomach and in their intestines <clears throat> so if they're on uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and newer they can have irreversible renal damage so it will accumulate more rapidly and causing faster damage because their body can't get rid of it and they just keep taking it and then it builds up in their system and essentially it, it can kill them fairly quick and that patient should be monitored for renal function and of course steroids so it's the cause of uh, dose duration and osteoporosis all right, so polypharmacy. All right, polypharmacy obviously is you know where the patients are taking multiple medications. Sometimes they'll go to different doctors, and different doctors don't pay attention, and the next thing you know, they have actually have got uh, you know different medications. They'll have medications actually will counteract each other. So it says nerve renal patients average between about 6.6 .6 to 7.7 .7 prescriptions each. So the number of drugs, adverse reactions. So a single drug about 10 percent. Any times they're on 10 drugs or more, they can have, they'll have 100% adverse reactions. So from practitioner errors, in other words, either they overdose them, they underdose them, or, this, or they give them the medication that counteracts with another medication that another doctor gave them because they didn't know that doctor prescribed them. Either they forget or they just didn't pull the records. Um, and then patient errors. You get the patient that you know doesn't have the pill box or they don't want to lose their independence, so they decide they're going to take care of themselves. And they get forgetful, they get a little bit of dementia or delirium, and they end up taking too much medication, which makes them very ill. So, obstacles to compliance. Expense may be uh, maybe a major disincentive. Um, Remember, uh, I told you about my mother-in-law in the last lecture. Uh, it's like 1200 bucks for one of her medications every single month. Uh, that's ridiculous. But, unfortunately, she can't take it. It's a medication that you know, she needs. However, if she doesn't take it, she's not going to die from it. So she had to make a conscious decision and said, I can't, you know, she's retired. I can't afford this. And so she doesn't take the medication, even though the doctor prescribes it for her. So non-compliance, that forgetfulness or the confusion, or it's very deliberate. Um, you know, once again, my mother-in-law is deliberate. But there's a lot of people that just forget, get forgetful. You know, they get busy in their daily activities and they forget to take their medication and not taking their medication can make them very 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 ill so some physical disabilities so arthritis poor vision or tremors so they can't get the pill bottle open because of tremors or they can't see the pill bottle so because they have poor vision or they can't get the pill bottle open because of their arthritis their hands hurt so bad all right, so adhere to these principles. Make sure that you take a careful drug history. Get the name of the medication, any generic or trade names on it. Make sure you get the frequency and the dose of the medication. And if you don't understand what the drug is, or if they're telling you what it is and you don't see a pill bottle, you know, make sure you write down the best you can and relay that information to the hospital. So to find the goal of the drug therapy, the smallest amount to achieve the desired effect. Um, so if it says 10 mil, up to 10 milligrams, that doesn't mean you need to give them 10 milligrams right off the bat. Give them a little bit of mil, a little bit of drug, a little bit of drug, a little bit of drug until you get the desired effect that you want for like pain medication. Maintain a high level of suspicion regarding drug reactions and interactions. It says know what other drugs the patient is taking. Always try to get every single medication that you can that they have to make sure that there's not any kind of a counter reaction. In addition to that, you know, remember that we created the um, medical information form that we asked our citizens to put up on their refrigerator. I've only seen one so far that's actually been up. Um, but if you get a patient that is demented or they're unconscious, 
We're not able to give you the right information. Check the refrigerator door to make sure they haven't filled out that medical information form that we've created. This is not my age, but my capacity is wisdom acquired. Okay. So if there's, or that's the last slide for this lecture. It was fairly quick. Um, we're able to get through it. There'll be quite a bit of review on the quiz over what we just went over. Thank you.